Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live digital launch of Climate Solutions 101. For those who don't know, Climate Solutions 101 is the world's first major educational effort focused solely on solutions. My name is Matt Scott, and I'm the manager of storytelling and engagement at Project Drawdown. And today I'm hosting a conversation with Dr. John Foley, who's the executive director here at Project Drawdown, and Dr. Elizabeth Bagley, who I work with closely on um, work at Drawdown Learn, because she is the director of Drawdown Learn. But before we get started and before I welcome on John and Elizabeth, I want to show you the trailer for Climate Solutions 101. Take a look. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. I'm convinced we actually have the solutions and technologies at our fingertips to get going and solve this problem. So that means that there are going to be new people employed in that sector. We get to build the future we want. It hasn't happened yet. The future is ours to choose. Again, everyone, thank you for tuning in today. I'll mention before welcoming John that if you have any questions, questions, definitely add them into the chat and comment with those. And hopefully we'll be able to get to some of the questions as we go along at some point in this stream. Um, I'll also mention that if you want to learn more and actually watch Climate Solutions 101, it's available at this link listed here. But without further ado, I'm going to welcome Dr. John Foley. John, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Matt. How are you? Good, good. I'm glad to be here. Glad that we have people watching, tuning in for this. But um, I just want to start out kind of having this meta conversation about things as we show the trailer of why why Climate Solutions 101 and why now? Well, I mean, clearly the issue of climate change is reaching a crescendo today. We're finally getting some political leadership, leadership in business, in investing, in broader civil society. It's not just the environmentalists who are talking about climate change anymore. And the conversation has shifted fundamentally in the last couple of years from trying to convince people there really was a problem to now focusing on what do we do about it? And so that's what Project Drawdown as a whole is all about, as uh, we're the world's leading resource for climate solutions. But we realized a lot of people kind of needed a bit of a primer, kind of an orientation to even kind of talk about solutions. Uh, there are suddenly a lot of people like in Washington, D.C. or in Wall Street or in corporate headquarters or in towns and cities across the world who are talking about climate solutions. But sometimes we just kind of need to get grounded in the basics, like where do greenhouse gases come from and where do they go and how do they affect the climate and how can we cut emissions, but also maybe pull some of that carbon out of the atmosphere? These things can be a little bit confusing, and we thought there ought to be just a basic orientation to this. Sadly, when we looked around, you know, what universities and different groups were offering, there wasn't such a course, as far as we knew, anywhere. And certainly not one that was free and efficient and online, which people could take just on their own time. So there seemed to be kind of a big gap, and we said, well, let's go and try to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's helpful to have that context. And I definitely want to welcome in um, Elizabeth to talk more about this from the perspective of Drawdown Learn. So Elizabeth, thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Matt and John. It's great to be here. And thanks everybody for watching today. Thank you. So I, I'll ask the same question that I just asked John, but like from your perspective, um, what, what's the importance of Climate Solutions 101 and, and why now? Yeah, well, I think, you know, to build off of what John said, Matt, we we have an awful lot of information out in the world about the science behind the problems of of climate. Right. We have lots of people who know how to teach about the science of the greenhouse effect. For example, let's say a, a physics professor who is teaching her class about 
the, the greenhouse effect, but um, she's kind of leaving her students really bummed out and hopeless and helpless after talking just about the problem. And we heard from educators all across the world saying, we need more content, right? We're experts in physics or we're experts in, um, in global systems dynamics, but we're not experts in climate solutions. Can you help us? And since Project Drawdown is the world's leading expert in climate solutions, that's what we focus on. And uh, we want to be able to share that with the world. So thankfully, uh, we have someone like like John on our staff as, as our leader, who is a global, global ecosystem expert and can really, um, and is a fantastic science communicator and can share with the world uh, information specifically about the science behind climate solutions. So we've got a free resource now um, available to everybody where we really want to shift the conversation from just talking about the problems to talking about the solutions and putting them into action in homes and communities across the world. Yeah, and I think it's powerful because um, I think about all the talks that, that I've seen you give, Elizabeth, where you start out asking what comes to mind when you think of climate change and global warming. And I believe only 3% of those 14,000 responses from that study um, actually are about solutions. So hopefully this uh, this series will help shift help shift things more towards solutions and, and actually create awareness around those. But just as we we get going in this stream, again, I'll remind folks, if you have questions, definitely drop them into the chat wherever you're watching. Um, the other thing I'll say is that we have some clips from Climate Solutions 101 to share. So um, changing directions, uh, overall Climate Solutions 101, it's six units, 10 expert conversations. So this is only a small sliver. But I wanna start out by showing a clip from um, Dr. Jessica Hellman, who's the director of the Institute of the Environment at the University of Minnesota. And in this clip, she talks about the importance of focusing on um, growing this, this emphasis on solutions rather than focusing only on the problems. So here we go. And I also think it's critical for those of us who are thinking about solutions not to just have one size so you must have wind power right but um here are a suite of options and you choose among them and they're context dependent so because sometimes the solution isn't appropriate for a particular location cost of course is important it's going to be different in different locations i think another one of the exciting things we're seeing society grapple with climate change is you actually do see a lot of local innovation and local solutions. So it's kind of like your doctor says you're sick, here are a couple of treatment options, what's gonna work for you? What is your insurance gonna pay for? What regimen could you stay on? You gotta evaluate the side effects and, and consequences of different courses of action. So I think we're getting better that we are kind of, we're as scientists, we're doing a little bit better job, like you say, of being the doctor and sort of sticking with you through the treatment, not just telling you what's wrong. So the part that resonates with me from that clip, obviously there are uh, lots of barriers and issues that we still have to overcome as a community to be better at doing this work, but the, what Jessica's talking about is that the climate community is getting a bit better at not focusing on the the challenges alone and the problems alone. We recognize those, but um, we're, we're making more space for the solutions. Um, and obviously that's what Climate Solutions 101 is about. So I just want to hear from you, um, Elizabeth and John, how do you actually hope people will use or how do you imagine people will use the, the series in their classrooms, in their communities? Um, what would be that ideal scenario for you? Elizabeth? Oh, sure. Well, so I think there's there's lots of different audiences. Maybe I'll talk about some of the educational ones and, and John, maybe you can talk about um, some others. Um, you know, first of all, we would love to uh, have any educator, especially kind of high school into higher ed, really use these in their classes as they see fit. Um, you know, we have low, one of the things we haven't mentioned yet is we have a whole bunch of downloadable graphics. So there are, for every unit, there's a lecture video that, that John delivers that's um, like a TED talk about the different topics uh, that we cover. And a lot of the graphics that he uses are downloadable so you can slot them into your into your lectures and really um, 
be able to tell the story in in the way that you know that we've been able to uh, create that over time. So we I hope they're used in classrooms. Um, I also hope they're used by to Matt's point community groups. So we work with a group called the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group, which is a subgroup of um, Rotary International, and there are 1.2 million Rotarians around the world, and those folks are people of action in their communities. They, um, there are, there's a growing interest in working on environmental projects. There's actually a new area of focus at Rotary International, and um, we want to be able to provide content to communities about climate solutions to help communities figure out what makes sense, right? Like going back to Jessica's clip, um, figuring out, well, <laughs> what regimen can you stick with, right? What solution is gonna actually be yeah. impactful in your community? Which one can you put into place? So Matt, I would say, um, we're hoping educators use these with their with their students. We're also hoping community groups, for example, Rotary, um, Rotary folks, as well as um, communities of faith. So houses of worship often have uh, study groups or study circles where they're focused on different areas. And we've seen a lot of interest from um, communities of faith also. Yeah, before before handing it over to John, I just want to ask a follow up, which is like, what are the, well, yeah, what have the communities been doing to integrate climate solutions? Because obviously some folks like those that you've mentioned have made space for solutions, but what has that looked like so far? Yeah, I think uh, what is just emerging because Climate Solutions 101 came out on Tuesday, everybody. So you're seeing this a week and a day in the world, which is pretty exciting. Um, we are seeing people who, um, you know, in communities, <clears throat> We want to focus, for example, on sinks, and, and I'll let John talk a little bit more about that, but let's say that there are some communities that really want to focus on helping nature do what nature does well. Well, they might want to check out Unit 4, actually where Jessica Hellman's video is, mm -hmm. and, and John's lecture on sinks, and a whole bunch of extra uh, recommended readings around that, and dive deeply into that content so that they have a shared understanding and a, and a pretty solid foundation about that content to help them explore the possibility space. Because there's all sorts of solutions. That's what Project Drawdown is all about, right? We know that we have so many solutions in hand today to reach Drawdown, that point in time where those heat trapping gases start to decline. Um, and we just need to figure out, we need people to start putting those solutions into place and figure out what's going to stick with our communities. Yeah, John, just over to you with that question of like how in your ideal world would people use this series? And um, also just what have you seen um, mm -hmm. not only in terms of how people have used have been using Climate Solutions 101 because it has only been eight days, but more broadly, like what what problem is this series solving from your perspective? Well, I think echoing uh, what Elizabeth already said is that we hope educators from kind of high school science courses, for example, environmental courses, through university into graduate programs actually too, uh, would find these useful, but not to substitute for what these teachers and professors are doing, but to augment maybe as additional viewings or a little extra homework or to drop into their classes because they're modular, they're, you can tear them apart in any particular way you want. They're short, they're very efficient, and they should be kind of a supplement to what teachers are doing. So that's really exciting. And I used to be a college professor for a long time. So I would love to have had a resource like this when I was teaching courses in this area. And we made uh, the images freely available and, you know, and a lot of reading. So hopefully this will be a great and free resource for students and faculty around the world. But also professionals. Uh, there are an awful lot of folks suddenly in government in cities and states in Washington, but also in companies and firms and nonprofits all around the world who are suddenly being told, hey, you need to come up with a climate plan for our state or our agency, our company. And uh, imagine you're like a new congressional staffer attached to a new member of Congress, let's say, freshly arrived in Washington. Well, last week you're working on, I don't know, welfare reform. Next week you're working on gun control. Where do you go to get a quick yeah. crash course on climate change solutions, which might be the issue of this week? Um, they have to kind of have efficient, very rapidly um, viewable, kind of consumable resources, but that are at the very best level of science, that are easy to watch. You can watch them on your phone. They're subtitled if you want. Everything's right there. Uh, so we kind of have professional audiences as well in mind because, you know, we all have to keep learning forever. And sort of this ongoing lifelong learning was part of this as well, especially for the for professionals. So I really love that. Um, I think we're hitting kind of an educational audience, certainly community audiences, but also professional audiences. 
And while this, this class is, quote, new, um, it's been out online for about a week or so, actually just when COVID was hitting the world, I, I gave started giving a bunch of these 101 lectures kind of to colleges and universities around the country as professors were scrambling to do everything online. And I think I've given some parts of this class at least 100 times <laughs> live over Zoom uh, starting in the spring into the fall. So um, it was really nice to get that kind of feedback and see what was working, what wasn't, and kind of which audiences, whether it's like a bunch of MBA students or a bunch of engineers or maybe a lunch and learn for a healthcare company or maybe a Kiwanis club in Maine or whatever. I did a whole bunch of these things. So it's really kind of nice to get that feedback and see, you know, you can offer pretty sophisticated science, but in a way that is digestible by almost anybody. And uh, I think that's something that we hope will be achieved here. Yeah, John, that's that's great to hear. And one follow up to that I have is you know, thinking about all of those talks that that you've done and all the questions you've gotten from people. Are there any like any were there any themes in in some of the questions that came up that um, that informed how you, you know, how, how we formatted Climate Solutions 101. Yeah, well, I think the biggest thing we uh, learned um, was probably the comments more than the questions. But some of the comments I've heard, and I'm sure Elizabeth's heard a lot of these too, was like kind of like, a, oh, thank God there are solutions to this. Because throughout the course, we build up kind of, you know, step by step, looking at different sectors of the of the global economy and different kinds of approaches we can take. There's no one solution to climate change. But if we start looking around and piling them up into different kind of in an overarching framework, it starts to fall into place. And we start to see, wow, we do have all the solutions we need to take a big whack at it. And I think actually solve the problem. And we're getting new tools all the time. So that was kind of an overwhelming sense of, oh, thank God, you know, somebody's talking about solutions and it's not all doom and gloom. We try to frame this to saying, look, um, addressing climate change is a choice and we get to make that choice. Uh, do we want to solve it or not? There's nothing preventing us from doing it except us. And I think people like hearing that. And um, so there's a sense of agency. But also, I think it um, helped clarify a lot of things for folks, like the importance of you know, why reducing emissions is so much more important than anything else we do, because that's what we've been doing for decades. We should have been stopping that 30 years ago. Yeah. So you know, if your bathtub's overflowing, you turn off the faucet first before you worry about putting a snake down the drain to unplug it. So we've got some kind of fundamental lessons there, but then we got a lot of interesting questions. People are so curious about like the role of agriculture and food in the climate system, because we we all engage with food three times a day. Um, sometimes we get people who ask about like, what do you think about like nuclear power or some newfangled technology or whatever? And I think a lot of people are hearing things from um, people who aren't really climate leaders, um, but wondering what they mean. Like, you know, Elon Musk is talking a lot about stuff recently and Bill Gates, a lot of very, you know, big time people are talking about this kind of stuff now. So we get questions about that too. So it's really nice. I feel like people are kind of leaning in and feeling engaged and a little bit of sense of hope or at least possibility, as well as learning some of the science. And that's the sneaky thing. Uh, believe it or not, underneath the hope, we right. snuck in a little bit of science uh, because people do need to know a little bit of chemistry, a little physics, a little biology, just a little, not too much. It's not hard to kind of grapple with one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. and. It's because we didn't listen to science, we got into this mess. We have to listen to at least just a little bit so that we make sure we can get out of it in a way that makes sense and works. And so hopefully that's what we're getting to in this class, but uh, we'll see how yeah. it's received. But so far it looks pretty good. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks, John, for that that uh, view of things too. And it actually leads into the next clip that I wanna share, uh, which again, focuses on the solutions and also touches on just, well, people will hear what it touches on, but it, it does touch on this idea that uh, just people aren't aware and there is that sigh of relief that solutions exist. So um, this clip is from your conversation, John, maybe a little meta with Dr. Leah Stokes, who's the assistant professor uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. So I will play that. So I think that as we go along with this transition, if we could just get started, we will find that there's so much work to be done. There are so much good paying jobs that we can create and that this can be an engine of economic growth and opportunity and job creation that we really haven't seen in like a hundred years, right? There's, 
when you get overwhelmed about climate change and you think, wow, there's so much to do and so little time to do it, you can turn that on its head and you can say, wow, there's so little, there's so much to do and there's so little time to do it. Therefore, we got to employ a lot of people. There's a lot of work to be done. And so the urgency and the scale of the crisis is also a massive opportunity. And it's an opportunity to get people to work and to employ them at a fair uh, wage and in meaningful jobs. So that was just a quick clip from, from Leah. But uh, the, the thing that comes to mind for me in looking at that is just the different benefits and barriers. And Leah touched on, or I should say Dr. Stokes touched on some of those. But I'm curious from you, like from, from both of you, what are some of the benefits that you see for folks who are watching? Benefits that you see uh, for investing in climate solutions that folks don't often think about. Um, and I'll just start there, John, I saw you nodding. So I feel like you have some thoughts there. Well, I think Leah said it really well. Um, first and foremost, and, and you saw this from President Biden as well during his campaign, it's about jobs. Um, in order to really address climate change, the biggest hurdle of all is probably replacing all of the world's infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. Every furnace, every boiler, every hot water heater, every air conditioner, every car, every plane, every are gonna to have to be replaced. And even at the fastest possible clip of doing that starting today, it's gonna to be 20, 30 years of work ahead of us to do this globally, let alone in agriculture too. Every farm will have to change a little bit too. Um, you might see that as an obstacle, I see it as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. These are hundreds of millions of job years that are being created around the world. And these jobs can't be outsourced. They can't be turned into algorithms. And these could be good paying union jobs for a lot of people. So I think that's a great idea. Um, on top of that, if we do this right, climate solutions and the employment and economic stimulus this can create for the world can also maybe help address some longstanding issues around equity and injustice that have been in the world far too long. And so we could kind of build a better world while we're at it, even besides climate change. In addition to, we also can see health benefits by shutting down the dirty fossil fuels, by promoting more walkable, more livable cities with cleaner air and more walking and more bicycling, things like this, but also better diets, better protection of ecosystems. So things like COVID don't launch out of the biosphere into the human population. I mean, there's really no downside to climate solutions unless you happen to be a major shareholder of ExxonMobil or something. But for the other seven and a half billion of us, this is a pretty good deal. We get to build a better world that's safer and more enduring and if we're smart about it, we can solve a whole bunch of other problems while we're at it. There's really not much of a downside here. But change is hard, change is scary, and people resist it. But I think now we're beginning to see kind of a sense of possibility, of opportunity, of you know, of potential to do some really incredible things. And I think we're starting to see kind of business, civil society, and political leadership, but finally realizing, hey, this isn't a need to do, this is a get to do. This is a really cool opportunity. Yeah, John, just as a follow-up to that, so I, I imagine that there might be people watching who say, well, that's great, but you know, wh why are we, why is it not all happening? Why isn't, you know, why aren't we at that point of drawdown yet? And so I want to talk with you about uh, like what what is stalling progress in your mind? And I'm sure there are, there's a long list, but in, in short, what's like, what are some of those key things that are stalling progress? Well, first, I mean, there are things stalling progress from being faster than it is. Mm -hmm. But I want to emphasize the fact we are making a lot of pre-progress, I would say. You know, we're, we're assembling the toolboxes that we need to get the job done. Uh, today, solar, wind, and energy conservation are far cheaper than building fossil fuel power systems. No question. Today, electric vehicles are cheaper to operate over the lifetime and very soon will be cheaper to buy and insure than fossil fuel vehicles. You know, the internal combustion engine is dead. They just don't know it yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing revolutions in agriculture, seeing revolutions in materials. I mean, you know, all these things are happening and a lot of them are super exciting. You see like the cost of solar, the cost of LED lighting, the cost of batteries falling kind of like Moore's law did with computers. I think we're just at the beginning of a revolution in technology and scale that's similar to the personal computer, to the smartphone, to the internet. And that's the pace of change we're about to see. That's pretty exciting. So things have stalled far too long, but the tsunami of change is gonna overwhelm 
what has held up action. And let's be honest, what's held up action is some very powerful interests who are making an awful lot of money for some small number of people who had a lot of influence in the world, especially in politics. And they were holding up action for 30 years, trying to convince us the science wasn't settled yet or that maybe this wasn't true. I think people have seen past that nonsense now and said, yes, climate change is real. About 92 to 93 percent of Americans now that know that climate change is real to some degree or another, but now they want to do something about it. And so I think the, there's been a, just a massive pivot, both in attitude, but also in the economics and technology, where I think we're about to see a revolution here uh, that could be amazing. Uh, is it fast enough? Not for my taste. Um, we wasted too many years not doing enough. Uh, that's a tragedy and we have warmed the planet more than we should have already, but I'm still more glass half full in terms of what we can still pull off. Uh, the window of opportunity is still open. We have the tools and the kind of obstacles are falling away, not as quickly as I'd like, but they are beginning to fall away. So let's keep pushing on them. <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth, I just want to open the, the floor to you for any reactions or anything you would you would add to that. Thanks, Matt. Well, one thing I want to add is, you know, this is kind of going back a couple of questions to when um, when we were talking about what really uh, what people were saying about the courses that the Drawdown 101 that John was giving kind of a year ago. Uh -huh. And I think one of the big game changers that Project Drawdown has seen in the last year is actually the publication of this is what I was rustling around for. So another free resource for everybody is available on our website, which is drawdown.org. Uh, it's called the Drawdown Review. And this is the, um, the most comprehensive update since the 2017 book came out. So if you all don't have this yet as a you know free PDF, um, please grab this from our website. Look, John's got it right at his fingertips. Oh, wow. Oh, oh, Matt, we're not going to make you go. I don't have my copy within arm's reach. So, well, and it, you know what's well, really go get one. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not right now. I'll hand you mine. But I think one of the really incredible um, shifts that happened in the Drawdown Review and subsequently then in Climate Solutions 101 that y'all can learn about. And this, um, we start to talk about this in Unit 2 of Climate Solutions 101 is really the three S's, right? When we think about climate solutions, mm -hmm. there are three S's. The first is sources, right? Reducing all the sources, like John was saying, turning off all the taps of the heat trapping gases flowing into the atmosphere. So sources. The second S is sinks. So really supporting and enhancing nature and what nature does well. And the third is society, really improving and enabling society to put these solutions into place, right? So those three S's, sources, sinks, and society, that makes this really big and overwhelming problem much more tractable, right? We can, we can, we as humans who are not very good at solving these kinds of wicked problems are able to start to grapple with the, the space, the opportunity space and find those opportunities and start to put them into place in our homes, in our, our communities, in our businesses. Um, and that framework I think is really helpful. So for those folks who are interested in learning more about that, uh, we start talking about that in unit two. Unit one of uh, Climate Solutions 101 is really setting the stage. That's where John in, in the lecture video talks about what's changed in the last 50 years. And it's a pretty incredible conversation about a lot of really tough stuff's happened, but there's also a lot of really amazing stuff that's happened in the last 50 years. And as John mentioned um, to your last question, question Matt, uh, we are lucky enough to be the people alive at this point in time on this amazing planet. And that means that we have the opportunity and the obligation to write the next chapter of life on earth. We get to choose that. So let's figure out, let's make it a good one, right? Let's, let's work on that together and make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind centering on equity and justice as, as y'all have mentioned and making sure that climate solutions are um, helping both people, everyone and the planet thrive together. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. And John, I don't know if you have any, any reactions or anything you want to add to that, but the floor is yours if you do. Well, yeah, one of the things we're, I'm really glad Elizabeth mentioned this. So those of you who are tuning in um, on drawdown.org, um, our main website, there are a lot of other free resources um, available. We're, uh, we were kind of known for publishing a book back in 2017 so called Drawdown, but you had to go buy that on your bookstore or Amazon. From now on, we're doing everything is free and electronic and down the road in multiple languages too. So we're trying to be a real open resource to everyone, no matter uh, where you are. And uh, this is kind of the latest uh, summary of the research that we've done on climate solutions. 
And in it, um, we kind of pivoted to like a new framework where we talk about like the sources, the sinks and society. But then even within that kind of breaking down, like a lot of people get overwhelmed by the sources of greenhouse gases. Guess what? You can do it all in one hand. 90% mm -hmm. of greenhouse gases come from electricity, food, industry, transportation, and buildings. That's it. So not only are we trying to give people some science, just a little bit of a kind of a mental checklist of like, okay, if I wanna solve climate change, I gotta reduce the sources in five big areas. Depending where you live, the mix of that five will be different, but that's your action mm -hmm. list right there. And within each one of those, there's usually a place for efficiency, like energy efficiency or reducing food waste or whatever, whatever, whatever. And then pivoting to like a low carbon way of doing stuff. So energy efficiency combined with renewables or lowering food waste and better diets combined with regenerative agriculture. And again and again and again, this pattern repeats itself. And so I think um, working with Elizabeth um, and kind of practicing this for a while, we found there was not just kind of like a list of solutions and like gigatons here and methane there and CO2 here. We had like a little bit of what educators call a pedagogy, kind of like a, a mental framework for helping people kind of remember what the heck's going on here. We made it more teachable than just presented. And uh, hopefully it'll stick. Um, I think our, our anecdotal evidence is that when we change the way we talked about climate solutions, it was a lot stickier. People kind of like, oh yeah, I can remember that now, rather than a long list of solutions and numbers and chemical formulas. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the hope. And it's a little complicated if you don't think through it in this kind of organized way. Otherwise it can be very easy to be misled into thinking you know, one thing is the solution when in fact it might mm -hmm. not be. Uh, so that's kind of one of the things we really do have to do a little bit of homework, but we made it hopefully easy and fairly memorable. So, um, but please, yeah, download the Drawdown Review. We also have a more detailed report on agriculture and climate solutions, which you can also find right on our homepage as well. Great, thanks, John. And and we have some questions coming into the chat, but mm -hmm. I'll actually go to the next clip first, and then we'll come back to those um, just before we we wrap mm -hmm. up. So, if anyone has questions, continue to post those on the chat wherever you're watching YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, uh, wherever it might be, and we will get to those. But one more clip that I'll be sharing it is from Dr. Marshall Shepard, who is with the Georgia Athletic Association distinguished. I'm, I'm, this is a mouthful, so uh, I apologize for this, but he is the Georgia Athletic Association <laughs> distinguished professor of atmospheric sciences and geography at the University of Georgia. Um, my words can't do him justice. So here he is talking about the role of hope and stories. So yeah. how do we kind of get there? How do we find the hope and the energy and the kind of the fortitude, if you will, to get to that better place? What, what buoys you? What buoys me are one of them sitting two floors above me. I'm in the basement in my studio, but my daughter who's in high school, uh, up doing digital learning right now, and my son's in middle school right now. Um, those two kids and the kids, and, I, and they're not really kids that I see every day almost when I'm at the University of Georgia because they get it on climate change. They haven't been polluted by the marinades that they've been sort of soaking in for decades, like many of the older generation. So they understand uh, the impact and power and risk of climate change. So when I see their energy, I know that there's hope. I, 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 we can get sort of deflated by sort of the, the inertia of the old school, as I call it. But uh, because I'm around you, that buoys me. But I, I think we see and we have to start telling, as you noted, these climate stories. I think we can't just continue to show, show on chart, charts and graphs and jargony things in our social media and in our media. We've got to tell the climate stories as we've done here in Georgia. Uh, there actually is something called the Georgia Climate Project and I'm involved with that. And we actually have a website that tells climate stories, real Georgians and how they overcame climate change or thought about ways to uh, advance solution space. Uh, the blueberry industry, for example, in Georgia is burgeoning because of uh, science and technology at my university. Uh, but within that, they still have vulnerabilities to climate. So we talk to blueberry farmer and we tell that story. I think people resonate with stories. I think they resonate with their studies that show that people resonate with what things were like in the past as opposed to this gloomy and doomy future. So I think we, as you know, John, we have to be strategic and tactical about how we tell the climate story.
So there's so much that I'm, I'm sure I have to say about storytelling. We all have to say <laughs> about storytelling. But uh, with that, before diving into that, I actually want to turn to you, Elizabeth, because uh, one thing that I know that you do a lot of in your talks is to give examples of climate solutions in action in those communities. And for anyone who's watching who might, you know, who might have seen those, what we'll we'll talk about relevant solutions and and so I want to hear from you like what have have you had any reflections or have you heard any reflections on the impact of those stories that you share for instance um, earlier this year we were doing a workshop in uh, the Pittsburgh area and so we had some solutions that were um, really focused on that area and relevant to that area but um, just thinking about localized solutions and those stories of what have you seen as as the impact of those thanks matt and i love so much the video with with uh, john and and dr marshall shepherd so for those of you um please check out the whole thing they just have um 25 minutes full of wisdom and and wit also it's a it's a pretty entertaining uh video uh so matt to answer your question uh, you know, when I started a project drawdown a year ago, and I knew, you know, my background's in educational psychology and environmental science, and I wasn't going to be talking about <laughs> nuances of the models that our research team uses to analyze solutions. Um, but I knew that I wanted to give people an opportunity to see themselves reflected as change agents in the world, right? So our our analyses and the solution set that you all will um, learn about in Climate Solutions 101 and that we uh, write about and talk about is at the global level, right? Because that's what the atmosphere cares about. We have a globally shared resource, which is our atmosphere as well as our oceans. And um, we're contributing to that through those heat trapping gases that we release through the sources that uh, John talks about so well in, um, in uh, unit two of the uh, Climate Solutions 101. But I really wanted to, um, tell a slightly different story and connect with people on a more community level. So what I've done over the last year is, is found a number of different stories that are where climate solutions are being put into place, right? They're being taken from the, we know that these work with these are, you know, global solutions, but what does it actually look like in Pittsburgh? to put the solution into place? Or what does it look like in Georgia? And um, who are the people behind that? Because one of the things that, um, that we care about a lot at Project Drawdown is that there are people who are passionate and prepared and have the skill sets to put those solutions into place in their communities, right? Um, we talked about at the beginning of the stream, kind of the transition, the dr just transition to um, having more climate ready careers, having people who are ready to put climate solutions into action. We need to create that climate ready career pathway. And so part of that is just seeing yourself reflected as a change agent being like, you know what? I'm super inspired by that person. I think I could do that too. And so that's for me where stories are really powerful. But actually, Matt, I mean, I would love to toss it to you. Um, everybody, Matt is, uh, you know, he is a, a seasoned, in, a seasoned, fabulous storyteller <laughs> and as you can already tell, an incredible interviewer. And Matt, I'd love to hear from you about where you see the power of stories with um, the content that Project Drawdown shares with the world. Yeah, Elizabeth, and thanks for asking and for those those high compliments. And I'll also just say of what you were saying was definitely spot on where I, I always think of, I think of a few things when I, I think of a lot of things when I think of storytelling now, but um, one of the things that comes to mind is this phrase or the saying that you can't be what you can't see, which I think is a good reminder that some people just don't know um, about climate solutions and know that there are solutions to this because the messaging has been so focused on the climate <clears throat> crisis and the problems. And while, you know, John, you do this, especially in unit one of Climate Solutions 101 and in your webinars, but uh, we, we need to recognize the reality. We also need to recognize that the other reality, which is that it's not all about the crisis. It's not all about the problems. There are solutions that we can enact. So that's one thing that comes to mind. The other that comes to mind is that stories are a form of permission. So with stories, we are 
inviting people in to engage with climate solutions or you know with whatever we're telling stories about but in this case with climate solutions we're inviting people to dream and imagine what their communities could be like and how they could be different we're inviting people to um, connect with with these solutions and the climate solutionists that we talk about so stories are are really powerful um not to pat my myself or my my work on the back i think that storytelling is something that all of us do in some way shape or form um which actually i guess brings me to the the last point i'll mention on that which is just that i think we have to realize that all of us have um have this power and have this potential to be storytellers and spread the word. We all have some kind of influence. Um, and so I I really could see uh, this community of people who's watching, but also others who happen to, to tune into Climate Solutions 101, spreading the word and helping tell the story of, uh, of Climate Solutions, of Climate Solutions 101 and how they could all be uh, helpful. But that's a little bit from me on, on the storytelling John, I will hand it over to you just because I, you know, what what role do you see stories playing or do you have any reactions to what Elizabeth and I have shared so far? Well, I'm just so glad you're on our team, Matt, now. Uh, <laughs> so you're really the expert here on this. And it's fun to have some of these titles as, you know, manager of storytelling for Project China. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. Um, I'm a scientist, so, you know, we don't really um, tap in so much to the power of stories, but it's so ubiquitous. Um, that you know, data are powerful sometimes, but stories are so much more powerful. They're more enduring. They're what we tell each other. They're um, also when they're relatable, when they're stories conveyed by or about people kind of like ourselves. Um, it's a shared experience. There's something just innately human about us. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing how we can tell more powerful stories as well as the data um, that are scientifically legitimate. They're about things that actually work um, but they're kind of relatable. They're like, wow, hey, that's somebody kind of like me, or that's mm -hmm. sort of like my town, and I can relate to that. And it's also showing more than just, oh, that's nice for the climate, that's great for the polar bears or the environmentalists, but oh wait, that created jobs in my neighborhood or in my town, that's pretty cool. Or hey, that's an opportunity to clean up the air or make my kids healthier or improve the local schools or you know whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, I think once we can start doing that in a way that's you know scientifically robust, needs to be, otherwise we're not getting to the traction we need to get, but also that are relatable, that are um, kind of getting beyond the environmental echo chambers into like the other you know, large number of people who probably care about climate change, but it's really low on their daily list of things to worry about. We need to kind of get up here where the daily life of, you know, jobs and equity and health and security and things that matter so much to people right now. Um, are really seen too, and then conveyed by folks that are more relatable. So it's not just a, a talking head, academic type like myself or whatever, um, being the messenger all the time. That's not really helpful. So I, I think this is pretty cool. And I think, you know, the three of us I know, but, I'm, but everybody watching, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up in a little town in rural Maine that kind of died in the 80s and 90s because the jobs just went away. And I kind of think, you know, when I do a little gut check on how to communicate this stuff, I try to think of like, I just wandered into a little diner in rural Maine, and I'm trying to talk to people about why they should care about this stuff. And a town where they got a lot of other worries. So you got to make it relatable, trusted, grounded, but also what's in it for me? Why, why should I give a, you know, damn about this? Right. And um, there's a real art to that. And I think that's where some of the storytelling work will be really, really helpful, especially with what you're going to be helping us do in the future, Matt. Yeah, John, I just want to ask for a second um, as I get as we get Elizabeth back here, um, just to build on um, on all this conversation so far, which has been really incredible. Um, we have some questions in mm -hmm. the chat that I'll that I want to pull up and, and get to. Um, one of them is from Josh here, who, who essentially is just asking, like, who is this for? What is the focus level of Climate Solutions 101, a personal community research, education, business industry, and or elected officials, local, regional, national, or global? And there's there was another question that came up in chat in the chat about uh, where this community is. Um, so again, about who we're focusing on. 
Um, I don't know if we've talked about this a lot, but could you, John, Elizabeth, just speak to how Climate Solutions 101 is adaptable or adapted to different different communities? Elizabeth, why don't you want to take that? Sure. Well, thanks for the question, Josh. We we appreciate that. Um, you know, we uh, it's actually we span almost all of those uh, all those levels. So that was one of the reasons that we brought in the experts to have conversations with John as part of uh, the Climate Solutions 101 series because we. Um, there are experts, for example, Dr. Leah Stokes, who we heard from earlier, she really focuses on uh, policy level work. And so she's got incredible insights about what's what's happening at uh, policy level work. Um, we also had um, uh, Marcos Costa, doc Dr. Costa from Brazil, talking about regional work across Brazil and beyond. Um, Naveen Ramankudi from um, uh, University of British Columbia talks a lot about the food system, which is a global system that we really need to reinvent. So, um, and and there are examples of kind of personal uh, community uh, business leadership. That's there are some great insights from uh, Ibrahim Al Husseini as well as Ramez Nam in in those interviews about um, kind of industry and technology and investment. So there's something for everybody, which is maybe a non answer answer, but um, I would I highly recommend checking out um, the the lectures as well as the expert conversations because there's just really rich deep content there that I think um, I think will will help shape um, shape people's perspective on the climate movement and how there are so many levers that we can all pull to get to that point of drawdown. Yeah. And if I can add to you, I think um, there's a we felt there was a little bit of a common denominator no matter what angle you look at climate change from it is really crucial that we are all on at least some similar page at the beginning about like, what are greenhouse gases? Where do they come from? How do we turn them off? And how do we get them out of the atmosphere? There's some pretty basic things there. And I don't need, you know, all the politicians to know that stuff. We need business leaders to know this stuff. We need community mm -hmm. leaders and activists at all scales to know some of these basics. And um, I think we've done a really good job in the climate education and science community conveying the basic science of the problems Again, I think everybody knows what CO2 is and it's a greenhouse gas and the earth is warming and you know pictures of icebergs melting and all that. We've done a pretty good job of that side of the street. But on the solutions, there's just a little bit of kind of, that's why we call it Climate Solutions 101. This is just the intro course. Where you go after that may become more specialized. You know, Do you focus on policy or business or political activism at the local level or the international level or whatever you do? Um, I kind of like to think of addressing climate change like a giant chessboard where we need every possible piece on the board working with really good strategies over a long period of time working together to address this problem. We're just kind of getting an you know, orientation like here's the chessboard and here's the pieces we're going to be working with. It's just the beginning. Um, but addressing climate change is a journey. This is just a first step in that journey to make sure we're getting off on the right foot. Well, John, you mentioned that this is just the first step. So what's next? What comes after Climate Solutions 101? Well, inevitably, uh, <laughs> there will be a Climate Solutions 201 and 202, we think. Um, we're still in the early stages of thinking about that. But the idea is, um, now that we've given people sort of some basics, there seems to be a lot of hunger for more. And so we're keeping our ears open. In fact, we'll look at um, people want to throw some ideas in the chat right now. That'd be really helpful um, to tell us, like, what are topics where we maybe could dive a little deeper that people are kind of confused about or could have, you know, be helpful to hear a little bit more from a trusted source or from a, you know, we can bring in other experts and kind of talk about like, for example, um, a lot of people care about agriculture and climate change because of the connection to food. Mm -hmm. Or some people love to hear about, you know, what can I do around, you know, uh, energy conservation or what about buildings or what about, you know, transportation, things like this. Um, we could probably do a more deep dive into those individual topics over the next few months or years. And so um, we're going to be listening and hearing what people are kind of interested in and try them out. What we'll probably do, I think we'll probably do them live, um, broadcast kind of like this, so we can be a little bit more nimble, do a few kind of on our quick on our feet and see how they go. But what we're always going to do is start off with the science. Um, the science is what the atmosphere knows, and we, you know, we, we need to be grounded in that but then kind of open it up to the debates about like, okay, now that we know the basic physics here, 
what does you know the policy making world say versus technologists versus business versus activists for example and that's where we can debate stuff but we want to be grounded on like agreeing you know what's a gigaton doing up here in the atmosphere and how do we get it out uh, so I think that's some pretty interesting opportunities, but we'd love to hear from you. People in the comments, throw some suggestions up there. We'll look at them. And if we start to see kind of a, a kind of a rush to certain topics, we'll definitely try and address those. Definitely. And thanks a lot. Thanks to both of you, John and Elizabeth, just for everything over the last hour and covering so much about Climate Solutions 101, but also um, a lot of great context for how people could engage with Climate Solutions 101. Uh, just one question I want to ask sort of to, um, to wrap us up is, you know, Marshall was asked this by you, John, so I'm gonna turn this over to you first. Like, what gives you hope when it comes to climate solutions and, and this space? Yeah, I mean, we live in such an incredible time in human history, and I think Elizabeth said it really well, that we have a kind of an opportunity, but also an obligation to change the future. You know, and I, I've said this before too, the future is a choice. It's not predetermined. Uh, nobody's written it yet. The script is still a blank page. We get to write that. And so once we kind of seize that opportunity and realize, hey, the future could be what we want it to be if we're willing to work for it, the future could be great. We have the opportunities, the tools, and the know-how today to make an incredible future that is more just and more equitable and more kind, but also more respectful of the natural world and more respectful of generations that aren't even here yet. Um, I don't want to live in a world where we consume the planet and leave a trashed world behind for future generations. I don't know anybody who wants to do that deliberately, but that's what we're kind of doing as we're sleepwalking through the world right now. But if we wake up, and we start to seize the opportunities around us, we can actually build a magnificent, incredible world. And it's all right in front of us. So that's what gives me hope. What frustrates the hell out of me is we haven't seized that opportunity so well already, but I think we still can. And I'm not giving up. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think anybody on this call should either. Uh, we can build a better world. So, you know, let's pick up a shovel and get busy. Yeah. Elizabeth, what is uh, out of that stirring, uh, stirring call to action from John? Like, is there anything that that you? Well, I'm sure there are lots of things that give you hope, but is there anything you want to focus on? Um, well, I'll would, I'll add some exclamation yes. points after what John said. So thanks for saying that so well, John. And I'll just also address what Tamash has in the yes. the comments, where Tamash is asking, you know, what concrete actions can people take? The fact that people are asking that gives me hope, right? Like I love that y'all showed up today. That you are asking what you can do, and I see mm -hmm. I see a real groundswell and shifting where people are not okay just knowing that there's a problem. They're not okay just knowing that there are solutions. They want to put them into action. And that's what I'm going to ask you all today to think about, you know, where can you step in and step up, right? Where, um, Matt, you say it best to use some of your words, what are your superpowers and how can you <laughs> unleash those superpowers, capes and all, for, uh, for climate action in your communities? And that's the kind of buoyancy that I feel when I get out of bed every day, knowing that there are people who are, you know, also jumping out of bed and putting climate solutions into place. And please know you're not alone. Um, Matt has um, done a great job with as part of Climate Solutions 101 on the landing page. There's a jot form at the bottom. So what Matt's doing, just so you can kind of know who the people behind the scenes are, uh, Matt's collecting information about how you're using that content and what you're doing in your communities. And we'd love to con we'd love to uh, connect with you and learn more so that we can really uh, co-create these stories of future of life on earth, right? Getting those climate solutions into action. So thanks for stepping up and, uh, and for taking action, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you, John. Uh, any, any final words before I let both of you go? Well, I want to thank the audience who's uh, been sticking with us for this hour, kind of listening to, um, you know, let's talk about climate solutions 101. We're really gratified that people seem to like this and are resonating with that. Um, if we could get, um, if I have a second to just kind of do a little call to action, yes. you know, we're a tiny nonprofit. We don't have a big PR budget or a big Madison Avenue firms on retainer like Exxon Mobil might or somebody else. So we depend on you, um, social media groups and others to kind of help us by word of mouth to spread the word about this kind of resource. 
So if you know educators or community groups or others interested in climate solutions and you could help share the word about Climate Solutions 101, you're doing us a huge service and hopefully them too. So I'd really um, just like to invite everybody here to, if they wanna take one action to help, talk about climate solutions, share resources, ours, We'd love that, or others that you find as well. So talking, learning, and sharing is probably the most important thing we can do about climate change. And um, it isn't just about cutting out meat in your diet or changing a light bulb, do that stuff too. But when we work together uh, to galvanize knowledge and inspiration and action, as well as just tactical resources, this is really helpful. Uh, so you're really powerful out there. We're all like a little media empire out there on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, wherever you happen to be. So maybe share. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could point people to Climate Solutions 101, especially, again, educators and community groups. That would be really helpful. And John, I'll just jump in too. And the reason I think that all of you who are watching right now are so, there are many, many reasons why you're so important. And one of them is that, you know, progress moves at the speed of trust. As a, as a friend mentioned yesterday, and, and you are trusted in your communities and you are trusted in your friend groups. And so being able to uh, share content that you can be confident in is, is grounded in science, is grounded in um, you know, the deep science behind the solutions coming from a trusted messenger is so impactful. So thank you for stepping up in this space and, and talking about climate with the groups that you're part of in your daily lives. All right. I'll close us out, but thank you so much, John, for joining us. And thank you, Elizabeth. Right. Thanks, Matt. All right. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for joining in for this live launch event for Climate Solutions 101. If you want to learn more, well, there are a lot of uh, great resources up at drawdown.org slash climate solution, climate dash solutions dash 101. Um, and I'll also just mention that, again, as Elizabeth said, we have a JOT form link included there. There's a little button that says sign up if you want to get updates, share your story and how you plan on using Climate Solutions 101 in the classroom or community, whatever that looks like where you are. And we're just really looking forward to seeing how you engage with this series. But Thanks again, everyone, for, for joining in. And I am, as I close us out, going to share the trailer for those who tuned in a little bit later. Um, again, Climate Solutions 101 is available at drawdown.org. And thanks again for watching. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. I'm convinced we actually have the solutions and technologies at our fingertips to get going and solve this problem. So that means that there are going to be new people employed in that sector. We get to build the future we want. It hasn't happened yet. The future is ours to choose.